Hello, and welcome to A Novel Idea, the show where we interview authors. My name is Noelle Bach. I am your host and also the director at the library here in Danvers. And today I want to welcome to our stage author Peter Swanson. Hey, Peter. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. So you just came out with a brand new novella, I did. The I Christmas did. Guest, which is right here. And it's your 10th book, if I was reading correctly. Believe it or not, <laughs> it's my 10th book. I still sometimes feel like a new author. I don't know why, but I just feel like, oh, I'm new to the game. And then I'm like, oh, no, I'm, I've been around for a while. So 10 books, 10 books in 10 years. Oh, 10 books in 10 years. Yeah. Oh, I didn't go that deep into it. So, wow, that's really good. That you're productive. Yes. That's, the <laughs> that's one thing I am, I guess. <laughs> that's yeah. a, that's a, well, it's a good thing to be, especially yeah, yeah. As, a, as a writer, too. So what drew you to writing thrillers and over anything else for yeah. genre? I mean, it's really what I read. Um, so I was definitely, I was the, the kid, um, the voracious reader kid. Um, Loved my library, loved the bookstore. Um, very early on, I was drawn toward dark kids' books. So anything with a mystery, um, anything slightly dark. I loved John Belair's. Mm -hmm. I loved um, Encyclopedia Brown stuff. Quickly graduated to Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew. Um, and then really very young, sort of 10 or 11, I got into um, you know, Agatha Christie and then any kind of thrillers that my parents left around the house. So I was reading like adult thrillers, way too young probably. <laughs> um, when I was about 11, I was, uh, the, the one I always remember, and, and some people will remember it of a certain age, because it was a big book, was Coma by Robin Cook, which came yes, out in I think yeah. 1978 or 79. And I read that at the age of 10. Um, and I grew up in the Massachusetts area, so it was, it was local. Um, it was set in Boston. And it's this very creepy story about organ harvesting at a ho hospital. I was way too young to have read it, but I loved it. Like, I just loved how dark it was. And I think I never went back from there. So I've always loved thrillers, um, dark stories. So when I got to the point where I wanted to try my own books, um, try and become a novelist, it was kind of a no-brainer. <laughs> to go yeah. the thriller angle. Do you have certain, were there other certain thriller authors that you really... I mean, at that age, um, the other local one, of course, was Robert Parker, who wrote mm -hmm, the Spencer mm -hmm. novels. Yep. Um, those were um, just total catnip for me at that age. They're, they're like quick reads. Um, I love them. Again, it was something that my mom had around the house, and I would just, she would read it, and then I would pick it up and read it uh, myself. Um, and then over the years, I just, I've fallen in love with um, a variety of uh, thriller writers, um, Oh, well, another another place that I went besides the library, and again, people might remember these, we had an Annie's Book Swap. Um, yes, I remember that. I used to go to the Annie's Book Swap in Chelmsford, and um, and they had the old paperbacks for cheap, and it was pretty much all paperbacks, and um, I used to buy sort of anything with a good cover, um, all these old <laughs> 50s paperbacks, so I got really into sort of... Um, Mid-century American crime, sort of um, the old pocketbooks. So I love John D. McDonald. He wrote a series with Travis McGee that was kind of this slightly macho series, but I loved anything like that. I bought all my Agatha Christie's there. Um, I got into Dick Francis, the horse racing. Oh, mysteries. I love Dick Francis books. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot. Like anything that sort of appealed to me, I would buy. And again, I was reading quite a bit. So, oh, you're you're funny is like your childhood sounds a lot like my yeah, childhood yeah. <laughs> so the same thing I was reading some stuff I probably shouldn't have been reading yeah, yeah. you know at that age is a little too adult for me but yeah. my mom had on her bookshelf yeah. and I was kind of like oh let me read that and I got not thrillers but I got into a lot of um historical like mystery romance oh, kind of yeah, ones yeah. so like the Victoria Holt was yeah, like yeah. a big one so the racier stuff yeah very racy yeah, yes yeah. very very racy for you know <laughs> But it was, <laughs> but I'm like, oh boy, your life sounds like <laughs> my life. Yeah, yeah. Up I lived in the world of books for a, for a long period of time, and and you know, continued to do so to a certain degree. I mean, lots of lots of reading, and obviously lots of writing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah well, that's fantastic. So now let's talk a little bit about the Christmas yeah. guest. So I I'm always big about not giving away any twists okay. when I talk <laughs> about anything because yeah. we want people to actually read the book. Uh, and, and not. So I would say this is a little less thriller and a little more mystery. 
kind of thing. Yeah. Um, for it. And very gothic yeah. feeling. Is, and I mean, obviously, I've read it, so and I know you do a little bit of a afterward to kind of say why you wrote yeah. the book. But for the audience, like, why did you choose to do like a Christmas story set in England? <laughs> So it was actually, um, and this is the only time this has ever happened, but I was um, asked to write this book by my oh. UK editor um, at Faber. So my publishing house in, in England is Faber. Um, my editor there, um, Angus, said, do you have any interest or do you have a Christmas story you want to tell? Because we often come out with, um, you know, a special Christmas book, a t thriller around this, you know, Christmas time. And um, it often does really well for us. We'd love to get one from you. Um, and I was instantly excited. And the other things he said was it doesn't, it could be a novella. Um, it could be a little different than your usual stuff. It could be cozier, for instance. It could be um, historical. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, re I was really intrigued. Um, and interestingly enough, went to my American publishers and kind of suggested um, the idea. And they were utterly confused. Like, <laughs> Um, <laughs> you're doing your next book at Christmas time. Is it, it's a Christmas thriller. We don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> and I think there's a difference between, um, the cultures, enough of a difference between American and UK cultures that they're more, they often have these Christmas special things, um, often Christmas thrillers. Um, but anyway, they weren't interested, but um, I wrote it anyway. <laughs> I wrote it over um, Christmas season. This was probably two, two years ago now. Um, and I sent it to my UK editor and he said he loved it and wanted it. And then I sent it, ended up sending it to my American editor and they said, we'll give it a shot. Um, <laughs> yeah, basically. Cause, cause, and they were like, Since again, you've written it. <laughs> we don't know how to market it. They, they said, you know, we do really well with Christmas romance, right. but there's not necessarily um, readership, we think, for, for Christmas, um, dark Christmas, or, or mur <laughs> murder, Christmas. murdery Christmas. <laughs> um, but anyway, so, um, but they both came out with the book. Um, I was thrilled to write it, um, thrilled for the Christmas theme, but also thrilled to write a, a shorter novel, a novella. So. Oh, that's great. Um, now, did you find it more difficult to do a setting, like a manor house setting in England than your typical storyline of your, of your thrillers? I knew what I wanted to do. I mean, I actually had the idea for it, um, and the idea I won't talk about because the idea I had was sort of the underlying um, criminal element of the story, which, which is hidden until the very end. Um, but I did know that if I was going to do something at Christmas, I wanted it to be Christmassy. Like I wanted, um, and I instantly wanted it to be Christmas, um, England Christmas. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to have like the manor house. I wanted the like, um, you know, the light snow, the Christmas decorations, the, um, like the full on feel of it, all the Christmas tropes. Um, and, and my idea, um, I knew it was going to be set in England. Um, I knew it was going to be, and we can give part of this away. I knew it was going, going to be um, about a, an American student um, on a junior year abroad in the UK who is not going home over Christmas break. So she goes instead to a friend's house um, and it takes place, it unfolds there. Um, pretty early on, I decided I would um, have at least some of the story told through diary form, so we get directly her um, her point of view on what's happening, and that helps me obscure, I think, the, the larger story. But, um, you know, it's, it's a dark story, but it also has all the, the Christmas trimmings, which is what I wanted. Did you model, like, the house after somewhere specific? Um, I mean, I had many manor houses in mind just from, like, <laughs> years of watching, you know, Masterpiece of Mystery every Sunday night um, and watching Agatha Christie movies. I kind of pictured a stone uh, manor house in the countryside. I set it in the Cotswolds, which is a place I've been, um, which I love. Um, you know, it's not enormous, it's not Downton Abbey, but it's not small either. Um, and I knew that the American student would be from California and be someone who's very much a fish out of water in the story. So she's sort of coming into this um, place kind of um, in awe of 
where she's been invited. And she's also speculating a lot. I mean, this goes back to what we were talking about, our childhood um, reading. She's speculating often in her diaries about what kind of book she's in. So she's like, am, right. am I in a romance novel here? Or am I in a mystery? Um, and then she remembers these, these gothic um, romances that her mom used to read that always had the same cover, and I'm sure you remember these as well. It's often a manor house, and there's a young woman running, racing away <laughs> from the house in like a nightgown. And that's like every cover of those books was like that. And um, so there's an element to that as well. It definitely has a gothic side. Yes, and I, that's, I was immediately struck by that actually as well because at saying like all these parallels, <laughs> spooky parallels yeah. between me and this book. But I also spent my junior year abroad in yep. England, up in Sheffield, though a little different area. And um, that was the same time that I was actually getting into some gothic yeah. reading. And I always remember I got into Jane Austen yeah. during that time period and one of my favorite of her books was Northanger Abbey which is the one that's this whole gothic yeah. kind of not horror but like a little bit of a thriller she's mystery actually kind story. of making fun of the genre yes, which is the, already yeah. like a, a creaky old genre so she's kind of yeah, um, she's, having fun with it but as it well. which is it's, and I think that's a terrific book it's like funny because I think it's one of the least books that anybody talks about of Jane yeah, Austen. Yeah, it's definitely the, one of her less popular. But I think it's a fantastic, yeah. it's one of those ones I thought it was so much fun and like just, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, got, yeah. it's got a whole air to it that none of her other books have. Yeah, it does. Yeah, because the others are much more mannered, right? Yeah, and yeah. this is all like, oh, this stuff is all happening yeah, in yeah, this yeah. manor house and uh, what's, ha. Ah. But um, so that was the first thing I was thinking, like when I was reading the, the diary of uh -huh. Ashley, I so much wanted to call her Allison for some reason. So okay. I have to keep reminding myself right. that her name is Ashley. But um, so it was for me, particularly reading the beginning of the book, like I was immediately connecting with it because, oh, I spent a year abroad in England. Yeah. And oh, I also like went into this whole idea of like reading these gothic and putting yourself into these, yeah, these yeah. places. So it was a very uh, easy draw for me to be sucked into the storyline and, yeah, and be like, well, what's going to happen uh, in this? And I won't give anything away, but uh, what ultimately is the twist, I guess, yeah. of the story, I didn't see coming. So oh, I'll say like, that's, that's good. I, I expected something else. Like okay. I, had, I had a dis different suspicion of where things were going to go. Um, not too, too far off, but still a different okay. suspicion of how <laughs> things yeah, were going to yeah. turn out. So I was, I was like, oh, oh, oh <laughs> when we, when we get to the, to the actual, what's, what was going on in the storyline. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was very well done. So you knew from the early on, you said that you were going to do a diary piece. Like, did you, what like drew you to that idea? Do you remember? I think, um, especially when you're writing a book about twists. Um, or that has twists, a mystery story. A lot of being a writer and writing this kind of story is it's um, when do you reveal information? Um, how do you hide what's actually happening so that you'll surprise the readers later on with what's really happening? And one of the ways to do that is through perspective and who's telling the story. So in this case, um, it quickly came apparent that um, if, we, if we're in, di in Ashley's diary, we're really only gonna get her point of view, and that will help me obscure what's really happening in the story, and we'll get glimpses of it. Um, what's interesting is then I realized quite early on that although this book is taking place in 1989, um, there is an element of memory to this book as well that um, one of the players um, in this novel is um, rereading this diary and thinking back to this time um, and that sort of led me into um, kind of the, the other reason I wanted to do a Christmas um, mystery novel or a dark Christmas story is because um, Christmas is such a such a time of memory for everyone um, and we think of it often in terms of good memories childhood presents Santa and all that but if um, someone has bad memories associated with Christmas, Christmas becomes this kind of haunted time. Um, and that became what I really was setting out to say in this book, how um, you know, it reminds you every year of past Christmases. So the music starts playing on the radio, we start seeing the decorations, and if you know, you've had um, a dark Christmas in your past, those memories can resurface. 
So I think that's what I sort of started playing with um, in this book um, as I went along. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the other interesting things right about Christmas is that you're bringing together people who often haven't seen each other yes. for a long period of time. <laughs> and there could be right. old what, resentments what could or go wrong? things. Yeah, like what could go wrong? Family, alcohol, resentment. <laughs> what could go wrong? All the, all the things. Yeah, all, all the, the elements, things. right. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you do some research, or you must have done a little bit, like the differences between American Christmas and British Christmas? I did a little, because um, there are quite a few. I mean, some, some just minor ones, like, they say Happy Christmas, not Merry Christmas. There's the thing called Boxing Day, um, things like that. Um, so I did a little research. I also happened to live in um, England um, as a student, junior year abroad. But also when I was younger, 10, 11, and 12, those years my father was transferred um, oh. to his company. So we lived, we up and moved from Massachusetts to um, Essex, England oh. for um, like... I want to say the years were sort of maybe 77, 78, 79. Um, hmm. Very formative years for me. And and so, you know, I drew on some real life memories of, um, you know, the differences uh, between Christmas in the UK and Christmas here. Oh, all right, that's kind of interesting too. Look at all these things I'm digging up about yeah. you <laughs> in, this, in this interview. The, uh, you know, having also lived in England myself too, when I was there around Christmas, you know, I always thought it was just like, as you say, like it's a little different. Like here in America, except for a Christmas Carol, right? Yeah. We don't really delve into many British sort of Christmas stories. Yeah. You know that, and that, and that one, you know, famously is quite dark. Like that's a like the Christmas Carol is a very dark story. Like it ends ends with a happy yes. ending, right? But like the the bulk of that storyline is also kind of a very dark story. Now, were you drawing on anything that way too? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, I think, n not when I first began, but as I was writing, I, I was like, oh, there's Christmas Carol elements. And again, this is what I was talking about. Um, a little with the, the ghost of Christmas past. Um, every Christmas is, is kind of rated in our own um, narrative against other Christmases. So we often, oh, that was a good Christmas, that was a bad Christmas, um, that's a Christmas I'd like to forget. Um, that's the story of uh, Scrooge in Christmas Carol. Um, he's, he's visited by these, you know, literalized ghosts, but they're also just showing him, look, you once were happy at Christmas, and now you're, you're the source of unhappiness. And then they show him, of course, his future when um, he's dead and everyone's happy. Um, so it's a very dark story. I mean, to me, it is the, it's the greatest Christmas story ever written. It's probably the greatest Christmas story that will ever be written. Um, I, think it's, I think it encompasses so much, but I think it also like, gives us, as readers, like, I, I mean, I think the argument is that in some ways Charles Dickens kind of created Christmas. Um, this book kind of gave us... Um, this idea of the Christmas retribution story um, and everything kind of flows from it. So I th I've thought a lot about Christmas Carol. I, it begins with a quote from the Christmas Carol um, and it was on, you know, on my mind the whole time. Yeah. Sure. Now, did you find it difficult because this is a novella and yeah. not a uh, long, nice long, you got however many pages you want to tell your story. Did you, and this is, I think, 96 pages, I yeah, think yeah. it clocks in at. So did you have a harder time trying to keep your story within a shorter page count? No, I was so happy. <laughs> I, um, I, you know, there's something about, um, about mystery novels is, is nowadays they're all around 300 pages. And um, I was talking earlier about getting those old uh, paperbacks, you know, like Travis McGee and old Agatha Christie's, um, those were often quite a bit shorter. Um, it used, used to be a lot of crime novels that were more along the lines of 200 pages. Um, sometimes I think mystery books can be too long, like they have too many subplots and mm -hmm. they don't get right down to what's happening um, soon enough. So it was really fun to not worry about writing a f like what would be considered a full-length book. Um, and I also wanted to give like glimpses into the story. I didn't, 
I mean, there were places I could have expanded along the story because we don't get a lot of different perspectives of what's going on. But I wanted, um, but I think the glimpses were almost more evocative because we can imagine as readers like um, what's really going on behind the scenes. So I, I loved writing a short book. I wish all my books were 100 pages. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's um, novellas, you know, they don't, there's not really a marketplace for them. There's nothing your publisher yeah. wants to hear less than, I've written a novella. Are you interested <laughs> in publishing it? I mean, it's true, unless you're Stephen King. But. I can understand that. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a quick break and let Peter read to us a little bit from his book, Christmas Guest. Since I have no family of my own, I am yearly asked by friends and colleagues to their homes for the Christmas holidays. I always say no, pleading my case that I am perfectly content to be alone for a week. And mostly I am. I read a good book, maybe rewatch some of my favorite films. On Christmas Day, I roast a chicken and eat it with crispy potatoes and Brussels sprouts. My cat, Elsbeth, likes a bit of roast chicken too, and I let her sit on the kitchen counter as a special treat. In the afternoon, I often clean my apartment or reorganize my bookshelves. Sometimes, if the weather is nice, I'll take a walk across Manhattan, see if there is a movie playing that looks interesting. I'm not completely alone. The doorman, Howard, and I usually find time for a glass of whiskey, and I have a close friend, also without family, who often drops by, although she hasn't for the past couple of years. This year, Christmas Day has arrived on the heels of a wet, sleety nor'easter that rattles the windows of my apartment, so after my roast chicken, I decide to skip the walk and tackle my bedroom closet. I'm lucky enough to live in a two-bedroom apartment, and I'm slightly embarrassed to say that I've turned the second bedroom into a walk-in closet, but I work in fundraising, and sometimes I feel as though half my life is spent at galas and cocktail parties. I need a lot of dresses and a lot of shoes. The closet in my bedroom has become my default storage space, filled with boxes containing mementos of my past lives, all that bric-a-brac that is impossible to throw away and yet completely useless. I open the door gingerly, expecting an avalanche of photo albums and souvenirs to tumble out. That would make for quite a New York story. Lonely single woman crushed to death while cleaning closet on Christmas Day. Cat kept alive by remaining roast chicken dinner. But the boxes stay aloft long enough for me to remove them from the closet one by one and place them on the floor. My goal is to throw away maybe a quarter of what I've kept. I start with a box that I must have filled during my first few years in New York City. I find a packet of photographs that chronicle a New Year's Eve party in the East Village, worth keeping, and a DVD box set of Seinfeld seasons one and two that goes directly in the trash. I tell myself this is going to be easier than I thought. By the time I've turned on the lamps in my apartment, I've been through almost all the boxes and filled two small trash bags. I'm working on the oldest boxes now, including one that smells like mothballs and contains my grandmother's purse, and another that has a childhood doll I'm loath for some reason to throw out. Underneath my birth certificate and my canceled passports, I find an immediately recognizable diary, white moleskin with a ribbon bookmark, and pick it up scooching backward along the Persian rug to rest against my bed. I flip through the pages, arriving at an entry from, from December 1989, exactly 30 years ago. I decide to take a look, not entirely sure that I'm prepared to go back in time to that Annus Horribilis, that murder murderous year, but also knowing that once I start to read, I won't be able to stop. There is a famous quote, the first line from L.P. Hartley's The Go-Between, a book about remembering, although every book is a book about remembering, isn't it? The past is a foreign country, they do things differently there. In my case, the past really is a foreign country, and yes, they do things very differently there. All right, fantastic. The so, opening of the book. <laughs> I know, good little teaser, and yeah. I, I like that um, listening to again, because I've already read the book, but now I'm like listening to <laughs> the opening again. There are, you know, a few clues. There are a few clues. There are a few clues yes, in that, you like, are like those couple of pages that yep. I would not have, I don't think I picked up yeah. <laughs> like when, when I read it. Yeah. The first, and that, like, so if I, re well, 
I'll probably reread it again at some point and be like, oh yeah, he totally yeah. was, you know, setting up some things there. Definitely. And I didn't even realize yeah. it. Although <laughs> it was funny because when you're like, when you're reading it this time and you're talking about the dresses and the shoes, I was like, well, that could be a woman or it could be a drag queen. It's New York City. Yeah, <laughs> it could, right. Could, could go either way. <laughs> I think um, I was thinking that too. You know, at what point when you're narratively opening a book and you know I'm a male author I'm writing a, a female um, narrator here um, how quickly do I say <laughs> that it's a woman like you know you don't want right, to if it's right, the narrative yeah. person it's like hi I'm a woman you know just so right, you know yeah. but I did throw in the <laughs> shoes and then and then she does say I'm a um, I think she says single woman in New York killed um, dies on Christmas right. day yes, yeah, smothered yeah, yeah. by items from her closet yes <laughs> Which you know that would totally be a typical yeah it could happen to anybody in, yeah. in New York City I could yeah. I could see I lived in New York City for a while too so <laughs> it's all about you this book <laughs> I know really I'm getting I'm kind of yeah, feeling yeah. like your stalker yeah, of yeah, my yeah. life it's getting it's, it's getting, getting a little disturbing. creepy yeah <laughs> well um, I really liked the book I thought it was I thought it was a really good novella and as I said I thought it was going to go a different way okay. than it than it went so I that's think I like that, to hear yes and so that's exactly what you <laughs> want to hear for sure and certainly I'm a pretty savvy reader so it's it's good when I'm not seeing it coming <laughs> so yeah. that's, that's always a good plus so I always like uh, well I also first wanted to acknowledge because we hadn't yet that uh, it is national ugly sweater day and that's why we're wearing our finery today and also talking about a Christmas book so you know it just seemed the right thing to do but I like to finish with this question, which I, th I think I know the answer okay. to already, but it is, do you <laughs> have a library card? Oh, uh, yes, I do have a library <laughs> card. I, um, I, in, uh, for Gloucester, Massachusetts. Ah, very good, which yeah. you can use all throughout the system. Yes, I used to of. be in the uh, Minuteman system. Oh, yep. Um, the sort of greater Boston area and I used you know I used to go to so many libraries I love visiting libraries yeah they're the, have you been to the Danvers oh you have because you came and gave me the book yeah, so yes, of course yes. You have. <laughs> yeah because you have been to the library too I, I assumed that you were gonna be because we've mentioned libraries several times during the yes. interview that you would be a person to have a library card but you know you never know some people do not go to libraries we don't want to talk about them. <laughs> we don't want to talk about them. <laughs> Not at all. But uh, anyway, but thank you so much for coming thank in you. today. It was Thanks a pleasure having, having yeah. you. Yeah. And, um, you know, you'll get to watch yourself soon. And I hope everyone's running to the bookstore yes. or their local libraries to uh, get a copy of The Christmas Guest or one of his other nine books that uh, Peter has put out there for us. And I'm sure you're working on something new. Always, yes. There's always, always something new. So yep. is there going to be something coming out in 2024? There is in June. In June. Yeah. All right. Okay. I usually have a book come out in March. This year I have a book coming out in June. Um, and the title is A Talent for Murder. Ooh. And it will be out in June. All right. Fantastic. Well, thank you again so much. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And I hope you watch some other episodes of A Novel Idea and look for us again in the future. So thanks so much. Bye, everyone.